Okay, please, again, as I should do for every single hour that we're together, apart from when we're doing an exam, please sign against your name. Okay, the last thing we need to do, because I was talking a lot before as usual and we didn't um, do that, is to get the names of some brave volunteers for presentation. Oh, uh, wait a minute. We, yes, you were here before. I didn't recognize the top of your head looked different, sorry. Um, but we've got a few people missing. Um, but is there anyone who's here now? Uh, wishes to volunteer. I shall need names. If we don't get volunteers, I shall have to pick names from the list at random. We need five or six people, maybe five maximum, to volunteer for uh, presentation or six here, two. We could have three topics. We could have three texts, and I'll talk about the other one, two people from each one. So anyone wish to volunteer for Filmer, Bosway, Hobbs, or Locke? Brave enough to wish to volunteer. Okay, young lady here. What's your name again? I forgot. Right. Can you put your name next to whichever to which text would you like to do? Oh, well, it all depends. I can't necessarily say if you don't decide you don't like it, you'll say, oh, David told me to do that one or whatever. Um, but as seeing you're brave, let me think, which would be a nice one? Which would I like to do? Um, go for either Bossway or Locke, maybe. And we need to find... OK, put Locke then. OK. Anyone wish to join her on Locke? Anyone wish to join... Our oh, brave person. You'd like to join? Okay, for Locke? Okay, let's put your name down. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so if you sign, put your name under her name, then we have our first presenters. That's a good start. Not so painful after all. Quickly, eyes come in. You're just standing at the door, yes? Right, okay. Capuchin, Dorman. Okay, well, guys, we are finding people to volunteer for the presentations for this topic. We now have Tuje and. Do you prefer Seda or Selin? Which one do you prefer? Seda. Seda and Tuje are brave ladies. They've volunteered to tell us about Locke. Uh, it'll be the end of next week. Um, anyone else? Anyone else wish to do a presentation? I shall be seeing them probably on Tuesday, the latest, to start planning the presentation. But we need a couple of other people. No? Yeah, because the topics are only two weeks long, we choose the presentations at the beginning of the topic, and then we'll give the presentations towards the end. But we'll put your presentations at the end. The ones that I will do, because we won't talk about all text, I'll do those first. So um, I can't work out the date exactly now, but it'll be probably uh, like Friday next week or something like that. Okay, we can have two presentations on Friday next week. So you've got just over a week to do this. And then we'll have the comprehension test while I'm away, perhaps. No? Okay. Think about it, and I shall ask this question again on Friday at the beginning of the class. And if I don't have volunteers then, I shall have to pick names at random, to close my eyes and just pipe onto the list of names, and we'll have to choose two people then. Because if we don't have enough volunteers now, everyone will have to do the last topic presentation. There'll be too many people or something like that. So we need to spread. Well, we'll finish this process on Friday. OK. Now what I want you to do is to have in front of you a piece of paper and a pen or pencil. And if you haven't been doing already, from now on, you need to start carefully taking notes. We're going to spend the next 20, 25 minutes starting topic one. Okay, starting to look at the background, the main ideas, introducing this topic. Then, for the second part of the class, 
I shall talk a bit more about essay writing. I'll give you that guide. As I said, if we have time, I'll play my guitar uh, in the last few minutes. Okay? But for the next 20, 25 minutes, try and understand everything I say. Take notes of the things I say. If you don't understand, please put your hand up and say, David, can you explain it? Because the ideas and the information I will be giving you will hopefully help you in preparing your essay. Okay? Ready? So, first question, simple one, who's this? Smelly Mel Gibson, okay, the Patriot. There he is, what's he doing running along with an early version of the American flag? He's rebelling against the King of England, okay? He's rebelling against the rule of the English monarchy in um, what becomes the United States of America, okay? Though he has personal as well as political reasons. It's a long time since I read the... Uh, saw the movie myself, and here we are, the age of absolutism and, in this case, revolution. Okay. okay, it's always good to start off with a question, and it's always good to start off with a simple question, what was the age of absolutism and revolution? What are we talking about here? Okay, before we go into the details, let's talk about the very, very broad definition. I've said it a few times already, but now we do it with the aid of PowerPoint. Firstly, what I'm talking about, what I'm defining for the purposes of this course as the age of absolutism and revolution, is political events and political ideas during the 17th and 18th centuries. So that means roughly this. 17th century was the 1600s, okay? And 18th century was the 1700s. So things going on during the 200 years between Kirka, round about, that means, remember, round about 1600 and later, all the way down to about 1800. Okay. We won't focus on, we won't look at all of those years, we won't look at everything. We're focusing on certain thinkers. We're actually looking at the slightly earlier period, uh, 17th century. We won't be looking at many Enlightenment thinkers uh, for this topic. Sometimes I do, people like Rousseau. Uh, we'll mention their ideas briefly, but for our, to our tests, our essays, we're looking mainly at 17th century stuff. Okay. So that's the time scale, that's the time frame that we're working with here. And as I explained and just said again, C with a dot means roundabout. Okay, it doesn't mean exactly in that year, it means from round about that time. In most of Western Europe, the dominant form of government, the most common way that people were ruled and organized by someone else, was by kings and by monarchy. Monarchy, like in monotheism we talked about before, comes from the Greek word monos, means one, okay? One person with power. So in this system, one person, usually a king, occasionally for the lady's benefit a queen, but history tends to be sexist, so it tends to be male rulers. One person has the power, okay? Now, that person can't do everything physically, can't be in all parts of the country, so that king or queen needs people to work for him or her. But primarily, all decision-making, all final decisions, all power begins with the king or queen, okay, the monarch in that sense. And some kings during this period are described as absolute kings. What does that mean? Absolute kings. Anyone know what that phrase means? King controls everything. Yes, in theory, the king wanted to have absolute power, total power over everything, okay? Uh, not just political, but social life and everything else, military and whatever, okay? So it means not just a king or queen that we uh, have, but that their power is absolute, total power. 
Okay, and some of them were very successful at doing that, and they didn't have to have people like uh, a parliament, a medjlis, uh, telling them what to do. They were the ultimate decision makers. In other cases, they were not so successful. And we'll look at examples of both of those in the next week or so. Okay. So kings, monarchs, whatever you want to call them, and some of them at least tried to be absolute. Now, the problem is that some people don't like absolute monarchs. They don't like to have one person telling them what to do. Maybe they don't agree with what that person says, or they don't like the idea that they don't have much power themselves. So during this period as well, we see in different places, in different ways, resistance and revolution. Okay. Firstly, people are resisting the power of the king. They are saying somehow about some things. They're saying, no, we don't want that. We want to do something. Okay, they're resisting. You should have a parliament. You should have some people giving you advice or telling you what to do about taxes or something like that. Okay, they are resisting that. And in some cases, it went further, and we have revolution, often violent revolution, okay, often leading to regicide. Do we know what regicide is? Think about all those, um, there seems to be lots of them these days, American, if you watch some uh, channels in Turkish channels that have English language TV programs, I don't know what they're all called now, there seems to be lots and lots of these kind of cop, American cop things where they solve these strange murders. Homicide, they call them, okay? And they find out it's to do with the blood or the genetics and things like that, okay? It's the same bit here. Homicide means what? Homicide means... He's committed homicide, it means murder, killing someone, a person, okay? Regicide means killing the rex, the king, okay? So sometimes people didn't just resist the power of the monarch, they ended up fighting the monarch and they ended up killing the king, but often members of his family as well, okay? setting up a new system, having no king, setting up something which we might call a republic, okay, or putting someone else into the power of king or whatever. So this is what we're going to be looking at. Okay. During the period of the 17th and 18th centuries, and especially the 17th century for this course, we're going to be looking at what monarchs and kings were like, especially the idea of absolute monarchs in theory. And in practice, okay, so ideas here, as we said, and history events there. And then we should look at some occasions when people, lots of people or a few people, resisted the power of that king and then even killed that king and had some kind of big revolution, turned things around completely, okay. Again, in theory or in practice, how they describe these things. Okay, tamam. That's the broad scope of the topic. We're going to be looking at ideas, okay? The purpose of the course is to look at ideas in the historical context. And what you could describe the ideas we're looking at here by modern terminology is what we might call it political philosophy. Okay, so let's look at those two concepts here. What is political philosophy. What do we mean by that phrase? What does it involve? And so on. Okay. Where does the word political come from? Some of you or most of you have probably done Hijiv 101 with one of the instructors. Anyone have Hijiv 101 from my wife, Anne-Marie? Anyone, one of her old students? No, no one here. Um, I don't know what everyone does because we don't force everyone to do the same thing. Has anyone looked at ancient Greece? Anyone looked at Plato and Aristotle and those ideas, the ancient Greeks? No? Being shy. Polis. What was a polis? Do we know? A city-state, okay? It was the basic unit of kind of what we would call political and social and economic life in ancient Greece at the time before the time of, of Plato and Aristotle and during their period as well. And the great city-states like Athens and Sparta and Corinth and so on, very famous. And in Greek, those city-states, which means the city and the area around them, were called the polis. 
And of course, what those Greek guys did when they were thinking, they thought, how should we organize our polis? How should we arrange things here? Okay. Should we have one man in power? Should we have some kind of democracy with some people having power? Should we have everyone having power? And how should we organize that power in the polis? And so what we originally describe as thinking about the polis becomes politics. But when we do that, we don't think about just the polis, the city-state. We think about the modern state, okay? the Republic of Turkey, or Tudor England, or whatever it might be, but the modern concept. But it goes originally back to this concept of um, polis, of city-state, which is where political thinking begins in a modern, not quite modern sense, but a traditional modern sense with those guys. So political philosophy originated as thinking about the polis, but for us, it's thinking about the government of the state. Okay? Who should have the power and so on? Where does it come from? These are the questions. So what do we got? Put this one down. Some of the questions they ask. From where does political power come from? Okay? How do these people, the king or the parliament, where do they get their power from? Okay? That's very important. Okay? Understanding where it comes from tells us quite a lot about it. Who should have the power? Should it be Davut Kral, King David, the one? Should it be all the people, democracy? Should it be the special ones, the people who get A for their essays will give them the power? Something like that. Okay. Who gets the power and how do we explain that? How do we justify that? And once you've got the power, how do you use it? What do I do with my power in relation to you? Can I be absolute and tell you everything you must do? Should I take your opinions into account? Things like that. So these are the kind of questions that are involved in political philosophy. Okay. Where does the power come from? Who has it? How should it be used? And so on. And there are other questions as well. And we'll look at some of these uh, as we go along. For us, there are a number of versions or interpretations of these questions. And we'll be particularly focusing on two of them. The first one I've mentioned already, political authority based on divine right, which meant what? Anyone remind us? Divine right theory means what? I, I'm not sure what woman meant by... Uh, not quite, although you could put that in some ways if you think about maybe what Filmer might be saying with Adam and Eve or something. Divine, Latin, divinus, comes from, ultimately, I guess it must come from Deus, which means God. Okay, so this is the idea. Divine right theory means you have the right, the ability, to have power because of God. Okay, so this is, we've said, Filmer and Bosway for us argue that political power originates from God. Kings get their power from God. Okay? So Davut Kral has his power over this class because of God. Okay? There's nothing you can do about it. Okay? God is all powerful. He's given the power to me. Okay? So that's pretty much uh, the end of the story in that sense. And therefore right means power here or something like that. So that's one theory and that we're looking at that in more detail as we go along. The other theory you mentioned is political authority based on contract or covenant. What did I give us another word for contract or covenant? A more obscure English word. What do we say? Another word, version of this is contract. A contract is. I heard of someone over there. Try again. Go on. Be brave. You're being brave today. That's part of the story. When we look at Hobbes, we look at what we call the state of nature. And that's something in his contract theory that leads people to make a contract. But before we look at the details, we have to just understand the word contract. 
Agreement is another option, okay? An agreement, that's what we want here. We're, we're starting very simple. We haven't gone into the details yet, but we're going to come back to the nasty state of nature uh, maybe later on Friday. I don't know. We'll see how it goes on. So another word for this, simpler word, is an agreement, okay? Between two or more people. It's a, it's a decision between two or more people to say, you do this and I'll do this. I'll give you this if you give me that, okay? It's an agreement between them. Okay. And we use the word contract today slightly differently, but similar, as a formal legal thing. I have a contract. I have a number of pieces of paper, lots of them now, because I've been working here for 13 years, um, which is a contract between me as employee at Bill Kent and the university administration. Okay, someone signing it, and then I sign it to say, we'll give you lots and lots of money well, maybe not so much money, but we'll give you a reasonable amount of money to keep you alive and so on, and you have to come along and make bad jokes for three hours every week in front of... No, you have to come and teach the students about history, okay? And if you don't teach them well, and if we decide you're not teaching well or you're not publishing articles or you're not doing your job in the library or something, then we shall decide you've broken the contract. And if we don't give you the money, Okay, we don't look after you, then we've broken the contract. So it's an agreement, two-way thing, what we call reciprocal relationship, okay, an agreement. And this is the same idea. They're saying that political power is based on some kind of an agreement, a contract or a covenant, as it's sometimes called, okay, between some group of people and another group of people. In some versions, it's a contract between the king and the people. Okay, you give me some power and I'll use that power to look after you. That's the kind of more or less what Locke might say. Hobbes sees it differently. Hobbes says the king is not in the contract. The contract is between all of you to give me the power. You've given up your power. You can't be nasty to her, she can't be nasty to you because you're giving up that power and I can be nasty to all of you. Okay, but I'll look after you as well. You see what I mean? I'm outside the agreement. It's an agreement. It's some kind of a, an agreement between people and so on. So very different from divine right, where it comes from God down to the king. This is something involving people, different combinations of people. And lastly, we won't be looking at this one now, but also during the 18th century, we see more and more the idea of law. Okay. In the 17th century, they had scientific revolution. I mentioned that briefly on um, Monday, where they realized that more and more the world was governed by physical laws, okay. gravity. Something like that. Okay, you do something, the law controls what happens. And we see people trying to do similar things in human society to say there must be laws controlling the way that people behave and things like that. That's what social science, in a way, is today. And we see some thinkers trying to take those ideas and then develop the concept of law in a legal sense as well. But we won't be examining those thinkers for uh, this particular version of the course. So for us, divine right and social contract, contract theory, are the two. And we have different versions of those two theories uh, as we go along. Okay, any questions about that? Is that all clear? Yes? No? If there's anything you don't understand, as I said, please let me know and then we can um, uh, try and explain it and understand it more. But these are the basic principles and we'll repeat it a little bit more and go into more detail uh, on Friday. Okay, you can put your pens down now. That was quite quick, but I see it's about five past. We only have 25 minutes left. So let's now move on to thinking again about essays. Okay, this is my first stage in helping you with your essay preparation. Again, pass it along and take one more. And I'll clean the board. even shut this down, can we, Emery? And then we don't have the humming noise in the background as well. Now, all of you have done some kind of Hijiv course before, I guess. 102. You haven't? You haven't done any Hijiv before. Oh, that's a terrible thing. You must feel very dear. So how come? I mean, are you irregular or what happened? How did you miss? Or have you transferred from another department? Or? Because I took another class uh, in 
instead of digital. Right. Form, okay. And they matched it so I can take. Ah, okay. And your name is? Merve. Hmm? Okay. So with the exception of our friend Merve, the rest of you have taken Hijiv. Yes? Okay. And that means, I hope, I say I hope here because I'm also Hijiv coordinator, so I hope those teachers are doing the right thing. You've written some essays. You've written some kind of assignments. Maybe in class or maybe take-homes and things like that. And you're going to be doing two essays for me plus you're going to be writing a midterm and final exam questions, which are kind of essays, but obviously very different from a take-home uh, situation. So what we're going to do now for the next 20 minutes or so for the rest of the class is go through this little handout here to show you, in my opinion, how we can put essays together, what things are good in essays. Okay? And I'm realizing now I should have put, maybe put an online version so we could have had it up here for the benefit of the videoing, but I hadn't time to prepare that. I didn't think of that before. But we'll go through this bit by bit. This is not some kind of mathematical formula. I'm not saying do you do this, 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 this. All you have to do is to plug the things in and then press the button and bing, you get the right answer. You get the A essay at the end. Okay? It's not quite that simple. But here I'm going to talk to you about the kinds of things you need in an essay and try and explain why, okay, what they're doing in the essay, what the function or value of these things is, at least from the way that I do it. And you don't have to do it in exactly this order. Every essay can be arranged in different ways. It depends what text you're reading. It depends which question you're answering. It depends on your own personal style and things like that. So there is a level of flexibility about this. You can change things. But here are the main things which, in my humble opinion, I think should be there in one way or another. Okay, sometimes more, sometimes perhaps less. Firstly, everything we do, absolutely everything we do in life, I think, should have some kind of introduction. Okay. I mean, even in these classes that we do here, I don't just kind of walk in and start talking about blah, 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 Thomas Hobbes or something. I say, good morning, or I say, today we're going to do this. Okay. I give you some idea about what we're doing. I open the doors. I give you a pointer. I point you in a direction. So you know more or less, hopefully, if you're listening, if you come on time, you'll have an idea of what we're going to be doing in the next uh, 40 minutes or whatever it is. So an essay just as a class, just as many other things, needs to have some kind of introduction. Okay? It can be a paragraph, it can be a page, nothing too long, that introduces some aspects of your essay. And here, I've suggested two things, but you could do other things as well. You should start your essay with an introduction. Here, you must do two things. A, address the question. As you will all remember, I have given you a choice of two questions for this topic, and it'll be the same for topic two and for topic three. Choose one of those. Your essay is just a very, very big answer to that question. Okay? All you're doing is answering the question. So it's very important at the beginning to give me an indication of which question you're doing. You can write the question at the top, you can discuss the question, something like that. You need to show me that what this essay is doing is answering that question. Okay? And you need to address the question. It doesn't mean you have to give me your full answer yet, because the essay is doing that, but you have to tell me a little bit about it. I have asked you to answer a specific question, so you should show me that you understand the question, discuss the key words, and offer a thesis statement. Okay, keywords very important. Understanding the important words in the question will help you understand the question, and that will help you create your answer. Okay, if you don't understand the words properly, if you misunderstand the words, then you don't understand the question, and you might give me the wrong answer. There isn't really a wrong answer because this is to do with our own interpretation, but you're going in the wrong direction. So let's look at the sheet here we did before. Do you think the theories of kingship in early modern Europe accurately reflected the nature of royal power during that period? There are some words here which are just 
functional words. They're just doing something. The, that, do, whatever. Okay? Other words are more important. They are the key words. Okay? So theories of kingship perhaps might be one. What else could we suggest? What other words or phrases here are very important, do you think, in this question? Any ideas? Royal power, okay. Uh, nature of royal power, someone said, two things together. We could look at royal. What does royal mean? First, let's go down to the simple word. Royal means what? If you call something royal, if you describe something as royal, what does that mean? Do we know that word? Do you have that word in Turkish, maybe? Sometimes you do have the same words, I don't know. Royal means... Come on, someone shout loudly. Microphone here might catch your voice. Hmm? Royal means what in English? Che, Lutfen. Kings, monarchs, something like that. Queens or whatever, okay? So already it's saying it's not just political power, it's the power of kings or queens. You need to say that, okay? That's very important. <coughs> power, what does power mean? Okay? and then the nature of it. So we've got a phrase there with these important words. Something like early modern Europe may be important, maybe not be. It's just telling us when. It's saying, don't tell me about royal power in the 5th century BC. It's telling me about it during the 17th and 18th centuries, for example. But perhaps that's a secondary level. Theories of kingship, theory means ideas. Kingship means royal again, things like that. So you need to discuss indicate what the words mean, show me you understand the question. Then it says you need to offer a thesis statement. It will be useful to let me know where you're going to go with all this. Here's the question, David. I understand the question, and I think it's this. I think theories of kingship didn't reflect royal power. I don't think that the ideas of Thomas Hobbes really tells us what was going on in 17th century England, for example. I don't think the two things are connected. History and ideas don't work then. Or maybe you do think and you want to show that. Okay. A simple statement saying, I'm going to argue this. Here's the question. This is what I understand the question is. And this is more or less what my essay is going to try and prove. Okay. Then here, at some point in the introductory part, paragraph or page, it says refer to the text. Okay. You've chosen one of the texts. Filmer, Bosway, Hobbes, Locke. Okay. And you're using that text to answer the question. So why not tell me a little bit about that? It can be a little bit about the author or something like that, very briefly. Who is the author? Do we know who the author is? In these cases, we have a name. Okay. What's the background of that person? Remember I said, for example, Jacques Benin Bossuet was a bishop. So he's in the religious hierarchy. So naturally, maybe not naturally, but we can understand why he's using the Bible to explain things, because he's a bishop. Knowing who people were is important. What is the title of the text? At least tell me the name of the text. Where and when was it written? Things like that are important things. Okay. They tell us a little bit about uh, the background. So introduce your text at some point. Separate paragraph or small part of your first paragraph, something like that. That might be enough for an introduction, telling me about it. Now I already know, I've seen a big sign, and it says, this is the question, this is the text, and this is more or less what I'm going to try and do. And now I understand. It's easier for me to understand your argument when I know where you're going. Okay? Signposting is important. When we drive, how long does it take to get from Ankara to Istanbul these days? Five, five hours, something like that. I did it once last summer, but we've got kids, so we have to stop and things occasionally. But um, <sighs> driving alone. And a sign comes and says, you know. 100 kilometers left. Oh, that's not far, is it? Put your foot down, go a bit faster or something. You feel happy. Signposts tell you how far you've gone. Okay? If there were no signposts between here and Istanbul, but you roughly knew the road, you'd just be kind of lost. And it's the same when I read your essay. I need these signposts, these indicators, so I can see where you're going from the beginning right through to the end. Okay? And this is the first stage in that process. OK, any questions yet? Anything not clear? Second thing, 
historical background. Because, is it here or is it gone? Where is it? Okay, it's gone. History, ideas, ideas, history. Most of the questions, definitely these two, because we've seen them already, both of these questions are asking you to explain ideas affecting history or how history affected those ideas, how it was an influence on them. So the historical background is very important. It's like knowing the background to people. Okay. I know it's quite traditional in Turkey to say that people from England are very kind of serious and boring and things like that. They're very different from the Mediterranean people and so on. Um, and it's probably true. Okay. Uh, I, I act like a crazy guy in the class to keep your attention, but at home I'm a very serious person, okay? very English and British, and I, I, I'm very difficult when we do the Turkish thing. I still find that hard to do. I kind of, oh, things we don't do that in Britain, whatever. Okay? Understanding where I come from helps to explain, in a way, my behavior. And knowing your background helps me to understand aspects of your behavior, okay? because you're products of a slightly different society. It's the same, in a big way, with these guys. Knowing that Thomas Hobbes, for example, lived through the English Civil War and saw them, not literally saw, but experienced, knew about the king being killed, that made him very upset because he liked kings. So he wrote a book saying, you shouldn't kill kings. You shouldn't have civil war. You shouldn't fight each other. Okay? That's what he was trying to do. We know where he's coming from. We can understand his ideas. If we take those ideas away from the context, then they make less sense, at least from an historical perspective. So historical background is important. Okay? What have we got here? Politics, society, economy, religion, or anything, okay? depending on what we're looking at. All these things that you think will help you answer the question, understand the text. Yes, I've got this again. Remember, we're trying to show how history, events, and ideas, texts are connected. So you need to have the relevant historical background information. Relevant is the key. Chapter 16 from this book is quite long. You don't need to tell me everything from this. You read it and try and work out which parts of chapter 16 are relevant, are useful for your text or for your question. And then you use that information in the essay. Now I've got, again, a thing about causes and effects. Causes. What important historical events or developments do you think influenced the writer? Okay, this is history affecting ideas. Tell about these things. Effects. What do you think were the possible effects of your uh, writer's ideas on historical events? This is ideas affecting history. Okay, again, we're simplifying it, but I think it works well uh, for this course. So historical background isn't just something you need to put in because we need to put that in to keep David happy because he likes history. This is something which is very important for the question and the text and your answer, and you need to use it. The main part of the text, however, is analysis. Analysis of the text. Okay? You need to read your text. You need to do your best to understand it, even if the language is difficult. You need to come and see me if you don't understand things. You need to listen to the presentation by your friends, who will hopefully explain some of those ideas in advance. Okay? And then you need to read it, and then you need to ask questions as you read it. The biggest question is not who, what, or where, but as we said the other day, the how and especially the why questions. Why did something happen? That's the interesting thing in history. Why did they do this? Why did they have those stupid ideas? Why did they have that revolution? That's the thing that makes historians excited. So in an historical context, in a particular time, which is our part two, why did the author write that text? Was he just crazy? Was he just mad? Okay. Or did he have some influence on him? What was his purpose? Why did he do it? Everything we do, everything we write down has a purpose. We're communicating from me to you. And I have a purpose in this, and the author has a purpose as well. Maybe they're trying to make people believe their ideas. Maybe they're trying to make people believe, not believe other ideas. They have a purpose. Good purposes, reasons, sometimes bad ones. Okay? We need to be careful. We can understand their motivation, their reasons. Okay? See if you can understand why they're trying to do it. It'll help you understand the question. It'll help you focus on your answer. What, therefore, 
is his or her main ideas in the text. What are the main points? The text can be quite long, 40 pages or something you've got to read. You don't need to tell me about every single paragraph, about every single sentence. You need to pick out the main points and you need to explain those perhaps in a separate paragraph or page. Maybe you can do, as it says there, a summary next, okay? Some kind of a basic summary. What was the audience of the text? Okay. A text is a two-way thing. It has a writer and it has an audience. Okay. You need to know the writer, you need to know the reasons why, we say, but it's also useful to understand the audience. When I write an email to my dad, hi dad, I will write a very different email than if I write an email to the rector of the university. Okay. I will use different words, I will say different things, because the audience the person reading my email is different. If you're writing a text and you're publishing it for everyone in the world to see, or are you writing it just for one or two people or a certain group of people, it changes what you say. You have to understand those. Think about that as well. It may be important. It may not be important. It may be important. It's up to you. And then we said the summary, okay? The main points, the main features. Look at the argument. Look at how he says this, then he says this, then he says this, and then you can see he's proved something, or not. Okay, how do we put an argument together? It's not just putting things anywhere. There must be a reason, an order for things. Okay? And can you understand that argument? If you can't, you can say so. I've tried to read this text. I think he's saying this, but I don't really understand it. Okay? And I've looked on the web, and they say it's this, but I still don't understand it. But I think it means this, and I don't agree, or something. You can say that. Okay, be honest, or come and see me first and say, David, can we talk about this a bit and we'll try and solve the problem. Okay, so that's the big part of the essay in a sense, focusing on the text. Okay, remembering you've got this question that you're answering in the background. And at the end, you need a conclusion. Okay, just as everything should have an introduction, your um, essay should have an introduction too. Just as this class had an introduction, as I said, I don't just start talking straight away. So in the same way, I don't just leave without at least saying goodbye, okay? Because that wouldn't be very polite, would it? We have a conclusion. I'll finish this class by saying, next time we'll do this, we might talk about this or that or something, okay? And your essay needs to have a conclusion. It's very important to remember, the first thing I will be reading is your introduction, so impress me. The last thing I'll be reading, the last impression I will have, is your conclusion. So you need to impress me there as well. Okay? All the stuff in between, well, well, we'll see about that. But conclusion, very important. Okay? When I finally put the essay down, I think, whew, was that a good essay? Yes, A. Okay? The last thing in my head, in my memory, will be your conclusion. Finish your essay, it says, with a short concluding paragraph. It can be two paragraphs, whatever. Here, you should finally answer the question. Okay? Develop your thesis statement fully. Build upon this bit here, but more fully. Okay? This is your answer. You can do this by combining your historical background information and your analysis. Okay? You can say, look, David, I've talked about the question. I've given you the relevant historical background, the reasons for this text, whatever. I've done my best to understand it. Da, 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 da. It all leads to this. This is my answer. This is what I think. Okay? This is my interpretation. I might disagree, but if you've done all that work and you've put it together, then I'll give you an A. Okay? Even if I disagree with you about it. Okay? That's not important. We're not worrying about opinion here. It's how you put your argument together, just like the author of the text is structuring his or her text. And here you can maybe add some more personal opinions if you want at the end. Leave your sort of very personal comments at the end. Okay? But the conclusion is very important. Okay, is that fairly clear? Look at this. Remember, it's not a complete formula. You don't have to copy this exactly every time, but you need to use this as a guide to putting your things together. Okay, on my watch we've got three or four minutes left, so shall we get my guitar and do something a little bit crazy? I'm only crazy for the first two classes. I'll be very serious for the rest of the semester, so enjoy all this while you can. I haven't even checked if it's in tune, I'm afraid. This is my guitar from when I was your age or younger. And as you can see, it's got smashes and crashes from when I was drunk and things like this in my hippie days. Um, and the name of this guitar is Big Bertha.
She has a name as well. It's a bit out of, I need to have the new frets, look. See, I need new frets there, but I'm not going to play up there, so. Okay, I'm going to play you two verses, two little bits from a song which we kind of, my wife and I as a joke, put together years ago about the history department, but it's is relevant to uh, what we're doing here now. Think about this song, listen carefully what I'm doing, then I'm going to ask you a couple little questions at the end, and then we're going to try and make it relevant to what we've been doing, okay? And I don't go plectrum, so I'll use my fingers. up this morning I couldn't get out of my bed if I don't have the class ready I might as well be dead cuz I've got I've got the Bill Kent history blues I came wanting to learn I went away more confused I've been teaching Hijiv for over 10 years And you know I think it's gonna ruin my career Cause I've got I've got the Bill Kent history rules I came wanting to learn I went away more confused Yeah! Now! Thank you, thank you, thank you. My first question is, how did that song begin? Anyone? Hmm? Right, okay. That wasn't quite the beginning. Those are the first words I sang. But the introductory bit was... And that already told you this is not something by Pavarotti. Oh, this is something kind of bluesy or whatever. Okay, I had the flattened seventh and everything in there. It told you already roughly the kind of song it was going to be. That set the scene. It was the sort of pointer in that direction. It told you it was in the key of E. I think this is tuned down a bit, but it's in the key of E. Okay, and all sorts of other stuff. And then we had the words coming in later on. But the introduction to that song really was just those first few bars I played, the first few notes at the beginning. That was the introduction which is what Sefa correctly has pointed to us. What's the structure of the song? Anyone here interested in, anyone play guitar or bass or drums or anything like that? Anyone know what kind of song that was? It has a certain name for that kind of song. Blues, obviously, but what kind of blues? It's called 12 bar blues. It has a very careful structure. You have E here, and then you go over to A, back to E, and then you have this decaying wanting to learn, and repeats itself, okay? It has a structure, very carefully decided structure. You know where you're going. You know what to expect next, okay? I didn't kind of go... Uh, something like that, okay? That would have been sounding crazy. You knew where it was going. The song had a structure, okay? Carefully planned. And finally, we ended with something like the conclusion. Okay, you all knew then to clap. You all knew the song was finished. It wasn't like one of those songs on CDs where they just fade out, getting quieter and quieter, and you'll turn the volume up to hear what it sounds like or something. It had a definite end. Bang! Okay, and you clapped. And that's what I want to be doing in three weeks' time when I read your essays. I want to stand up and clap when I finished your essay and give you A. Okay, because you've got your introduction, you've got your structure, and you've got your conclusion, and you've done your best to read everything. Okay, do you think you can do that? Yeah. Thank you very much. See you all on Friday.